Welcome. And thank you for joining us for a discussion on national security, economic prosperity, and Canada's future with David Vigneault, the Director of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. My name is Aaron Schull. I'm the Managing Director and General Counsel at CG. It's a pleasure to have you with us. When considering national security policy in Canada, we have to think about the velocity of change that we're facing in the threat environment, the complexity of the issues, and the significance of technology. In the face of this, we need new strategic thinking and must overcome a tendency to do siloed assessments and policy frameworks. Those days are over. Foreign policy, domestic innovation, national prosperity, IP policy, data governance, cybersecurity, and trade are now all inextricably linked. Adversarial states now seek advantage across these areas, treating them as strategically linked, and we need to do the same. In short, the world around us has reoriented, and we need to reorient our thinking. New threats have emerged since our last national security policy in 2004, and new response capabilities are at hand. This is why CG recently launched a major research project aimed at reimagining a national security strategy for the 21st century. Whether it's quantum computing, artificial intelligence, or space as a new operational domain, one thing is clear. Emerging technology is propelling rapid change. Within this, there are shifting alliances, worrying geopolitical trends, and the reemergence of great power competition. A new strategic framework is needed that identifies emerging and non-traditional threats to national security, the interrelationships between them, as well as the ways that Canada can influence global policy and rulemaking to better protect future prosperity and to enhance domestic security. It's in this context that I am delighted to introduce our speaker, David Vigneault. In June 2017, David Vigneault became the ninth director of CSIS. Prior to his appointment as director, Mr. Vigneault served as Assistant Secretary to Cabinet, Security Intelligence uh, in the Privy Council Office from 2013 to 2017, and as such, he is uniquely positioned to speak to us about national security, economic prosperity, and Canada's future. Please note that this event will take place in English. However, the director's remarks will be available in French, and he would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have in French during the Q&A portion of our discussion. David, thank you so much for joining us. Over to you, sir. Merci, Aaron, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. I recognize the challenge of organizing events like this one in our new normal and would like to express my sincere gratitude to CG for doing so. It's a bit unusual for me uh, today as the tables have turned. You can see me and I cannot see you. Usually I'm the one on the outside looking in. I have often commented on the need for a sophisticated dialogue of national security issues, one frame in the Canadian context. These issues are far too important to be left to the agencies alone and this is precisely why we need you to be involved. We need to engage with each other more, break down traditional silos, and integrate our thinking. I am pleased to see that CG has recently launched a research project that will serve to address this gap in a meaningful way. There is a lot of uncertainty in our world today. Much has changed at such a rapid pace. Undoubtedly, this will continue in the foreseeable future. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound impact on every aspect of our lives. Despite this stress, CSIS remained vigilant of national security threats both old and new, and carried out its mission to protect Canadians. As all of us adjusted to the new environment, so did the threat actors. CSIS pivoted in part by stepping out of the shadows to shine a brighter light on threats to Canada's national security. The fluid and rapidly evolving environment created by COVID-19 has created a situation ripe for exploitation by threat actors seeking to cause harm or advance their own interests. With many Canadians working from home, threat actors are presented with even more opportunities to conduct malicious online activities. For instance, we have seen the continued use of online platforms by violent extremists to recruit others and to spread their hateful messaging. Anti-authority narratives and conspiracy theories about the pandemic to rationalize and justify violence. We are also seeing an increase in the exploitation of cyber tools to steal sensitive information, conduct ransomware attacks, and cause disruption. In addition, we remain aware of the efforts of state adversaries to spread disinformation about pandemic responses 
in an attempt to discredit government efforts and diminish con confidence in vaccine rollout efforts. With the world becoming even smaller and more competitive, states are naturally seeking every advantage to position themselves as leaders in the global economy. As a result of this competitive thirst, hostile actors seek to leverage all elements of state power to advance their national interests. While not new, this has accelerated during the global pandemic and will continue to do so as we attempt to emerge from an event that has shattered national economies. From a national security perspective, the threat from hostile activity by state actors in all of its forms represents a significant danger to Canada's prosperity and sovereignty. For instance, espionage can have a profound impact on the security of our research and development and ultimately to the success of our companies. By subverting our ability to innovate and commercialize research, espionage results in lost jobs and diminished economic growth. Foreign interference, on the other hand, seeks to undermine our institutions, threatens our democratic systems and our citizens. Above all, this activity erodes our sovereignty and undercut our societal norms. Together, this one-two punch contributes to a complex environment full of other threats. With that in mind, I would like to turn to providing you with an update about the threats we are currently facing. Violent extremism continues to represent a deeply concerning threat to public safety and a significant area of focus for CSIS. The trend landscape surrounding religiously, politically, ideologically motivated violent extremism continues to evolve and has increased in complexity. Threat actors who commit violent acts are more often no longer influenced by a singular and definable belief system, but a range of very personal and uh, diverse grievances and narratives. Today, threat actors leverage a range of readily available communication tools and platforms that enable them to communicate securely with one another. They use these tools to spread and amplify extremist messaging, recruit others, and finance and plan activities all without getting off their living couch. Living room couch, yeah. For example, we've seen Canadians move from supporting Daesh to involve uh, to violent misogyny within a short period of time. The flash to bang is very short. CSIS is uh, seeing a rise in the threat from biologically, violent, motiva ideologically motivated violent extremism, or IMVE, as we say. Indeed, since 2014, Canadians motivated in all or in part by their extreme views in the sphere have killed 21 and wounded 40 on Canadian soil. In 2019, two IMV groups were added to Canada's list of terrorist entities for the first time, with another four being added just this last week. This issue is broad and complex. It represents a societal problem that will require a holistic approach involving all elements of civil society to address it. As with religiously motivated violent extremism, CSIS plays a key role alongside intelligence and law enforcement partners in that broader government response. While violent extremism remains an ongoing threat to our safety and a significant preoccupation for CSIS, the greatest strategic threat to Canada's national security comes from hostile activities by foreign states. While we focus on protecting our citizens, we bear witness to hostile states leveraging all elements of their state apparatus to advance their national security at Canada's expense. Historically, spies were focused on obtaining Canadian political, military, and diplomatic secrets. These secrets are still attractive today, and our adversaries are more focused uh, are on intellectual property and advanced research held on computer systems in small startups, corporate boardrooms, or university labs across the country. State cybersecurity actors continue to target sensitive and proprietary data that resides on these networks, some of which remain open and accessible. They will continue to deploy tradecraft that is highly creative and deceptive to gain access to data that holds strategic and tactical value. These actors are able to leverage emerging technologies such as bulk data collection, or AI-powered analytics to their advantage. With full integration, they pull from common data pools to identify threats and vulnerabilities. Without strong defenses to protect our citizens' data, 
It is easily accessed and can be used to drive further, further development of AI capabilities. For instance, in 2020, global news sources revealed that Genoa Data Technology, which primarily serves China's military and intelligence services, has been gathering sensitive data on 2.4 million individuals across the globe, and that for several years. Approximately 20% of this data was not publicly available and likely accessed via cyber espionage. Canadian companies in almost all sectors of our economy is also targeted. They have been compromised and have suffered losses from human and cyber-enabled threats. CSIS has observed persistent and sophisticated state-sponsored threat activity for many years and continue now to see a rise in the frequency and sophistication of this threat activity. CSIS actively investigate this daily from Canada and abroad. In particular, I would cite Canada's biopharma and health sector, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, ocean technology, and aerospace sectors as facing particularly severe threat activity today. Emerging technologies in these sectors are also among the most vulnerable to state-sponsored espionage, given that they are largely developed within academia and small startups. They are attractive targets because they have many less security awareness or protections in place. They are also more likely to pursue financial and collaboration opportunities, which can, and sadly are, exploited by other countries. Our investigations reveal that this threat has unfortunately caused significant harm to Canadian companies. Collectively, it jeopardizes Canada's knowledge-based economy. When our most innovative technology and know-how is lost, it is our country's future that is being stolen. Our adversaries do not play by globally accepted rules. Some countries do not reciprocate Canada's openness and support for a level playing field, and others are aggressively advancing their own economic, intelligence, and military state's interest at our expense. This is no longer traditional private commerce. This is state capitalism, and it creates a skewed playing field in which our private sector is always at a disadvantage. Employees, former employees, students, professors, contractors, business associates, or any individual with inside knowledge or access to an organization's systems can be targeted by hostile intelligence services to wittingly or unwittingly steal sensitive information. An insider acting at the behest of a threat actor can compromise a system and cause damage or open a back door to allow access from the street, from across the street or across an ocean. They can steal information outright and walk it out the door on a flash drive. It is no secret that we are most concerned about the actions by the governments of countries like Russia and China. But we should also not discount the threat activity evolves and can originate from anywhere in the world. China is an important actor on the world stage and a partner for, for Canada in some important fronts. Canada and Canadians have benefited for decades from the from relationship with Chinese researchers, scholars, artists, business people, and others. And our cultural mosaic is the richer because of the presence of Chinese Canadians across the country, in large cities and in small towns dotting every corner of Canada. To be clear, the threat does not come from the Chinese people, but rather from the government of China that is pursuing a strategy for geopolitical advantage on all fronts economic, technological, political, and military, and using all elements, of, all elements of state power to carry out activities that are a direct threat to our national security and sovereignty. We all must strengthen our defenses. I will now focus on the threat of foreign interference. Foreign interference has always been present in Canada, but its scale, speed, range, and impact have grown as a result of globalization and technology. We are increasingly seeing social media being leveraged to spread disinformation or run influence campaigns, campaigns designed to confuse or divide public opinion, interfere in healthy public debate and political discourse, and ultimately create social tensions. Efforts by foreign states to target politicians, political parties, and electoral processes in order to covertly influence Canadian public policy, public opinion, and ultimately undermine our democracy and democratic processes represent some of the most paramount concerns. 
Our electoral system has been shown to be resilient, but we also must work hard to keep it that way. Vigilance is the best defense. A number of foreign states engage in hostile actions that routinely threaten and intimidate individuals in Canada to instill fear, silence dissent, and pressure political opponents. One notable example of this is the government of China's covert global operation known as Operation Fox Hunt, which claims to target corruption, but is also believed to have been used to target and quiet dissidents to the regime. Those threatened often lack the resources to defend themselves or are unaware that they can report these activities to Canadian authorities, including CSIS. Moreover, these activities are different from the norms of diplomatically activity, diplomatic activity because they cross the line by attempting to undermine our democratic processes and threaten our citizens in a covert and clandestine manner. Today, I felt it was important to provide you with this update on the threat environment, given the significance of the changes. The world has changed significantly, and so have the threats in short order. What has not changed, it must not, is how innovative and dedicated CSIS employees are. The high quality of our investigations, our analysis, the advice we provide, and our decisiveness around taking actions to address the threats has not changed. However, we need to ensure that CSIS authorities continue to evolve so that they are able to address the challenges of the significantly more complex environment around us. Today's threats manifest themselves in a vastly different way than they did in 1984 when the CSIS Act was enacted. An act better suited to the threats of the Cold War era greatly impedes our ability to use modern tools and assess data and information. We need laws that enable these types of data-driven investigations, carefully constructed to reflect the values we share in our democracy, including assurances of robust privacy protections. Our act enables uh, advice to government, but limits our ability to provide relevant advice to key partners, including many of you listening today. Our act sets technological limitations on the intelligence collections, collection that were not foreseen by the draft of the legislation in 1984, and unduly limit our investigations in a modern era. These are simply a few examples of the challenges of our authorities. At CSIS, we take our social license with Canadians very seriously. Contrary to many of our adversaries, CSIS operates in a democracy governed by the rule of law, not by the law of the rulers. We strive for the best in accountability and see a healthy discussion on the expectations that Canadians have of their national security agencies and whether the laws of CAF kept pace as a meaningful contribution to that accountability. We need your help as advocates and partners in this effort. I would like to take this opportunity to elaborate further on the need for strong partnerships. Whether we're talking violent extremism, espionage, or foreign interference, no single government department or agency can deal with these threats alone. If we want to be effective in countering modern threats, we must build strategic partnerships within and outside government. Partnerships facilitate information sharing, consultation, the, po the pooling of resources and expertise, and joint actions. I'm seeing this happen in real time with the pandemic. By sharing what we know about a number of related issues, CSIS has increased and deepened its cooperation with partners like the Public Health Agency of Canada. We're also working closely with partners like Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada to raise awareness of the foreign investment that could impact our national security. We are doing as much as we can to harden the target. I, talk about, I talked about how we stepped out of the shadows during the pandemic. Immediately, we sat at Canadian universities, medical research institutes, pharmaceutical companies, and others involved in the national response to the pandemic were facing an elevated threat, of, uh, risk, uh, threat and risk to their cybersecurity. <laughs> CSIS worked closely with its partners in universities alongside the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity to respond accordingly. The need for partnerships also extends outside of our borders, especially among the Five Eyes, the G7, and other like-minded liberal democracies. It is only through the mobilization of like-minded partners that we can raise the cost to hostile activities. Keeping Canada safe requires a national security literate population. 
By this, I mean a citizenry that understands the key dilemmas Canada faces and recognizes the need to adapt and respond in a thoughtful, meaningful, and timely way. I encourage you to consider CSIS as a partner and to contact us for information, advice, or support as your companies, universities, or associations navigate increasingly complex geopolitical waters. You may think to yourself, I am not a national security person. I'm a scientist, a business person, or academic, and so on. I'm not interested in geopolitics. Well, I can say with a high level of confidence that geopolitics is interested in you. And it is important that you know how you can be at risk and how you can protect your interests. When you reach out to us, you'll appreciate the expertise and dedication of CSIS employees. As director of the service, I take the greatest pride in the quality of our workforce. People As Canada's Secret Intelligence Service, CSIS must reflect the society it protects. Just like the people of Canada, we are a diverse and inclusive workforce. Our diversity allows us to better understand communities and help us maintain bond of confidence and trust that needs a bed to exist between civil society and an intelligence agency. In exchange for the trust that Canadians place in us, we commit to high standards of accountability. My remarks today have painted a picture of the key threats we all need to be aware of and, uh, and uh, have a role in countering. I can assure you that CSIS, along with Government of Canada and international partners, are actively investigating, monitoring, and disrupting harmful threat actors when our lawful mandates allow. This builds on active efforts undertaken by the Government of Canada to protect Canadians and their interests. For example, we have increased scrutiny on all foreign direct investment under the national security provision of the Investment Canada Act. And there is ongoing work to this, uh, through the Security Intelligence Threat to Election Task Force to counter foreign interference against threats to elections. Moreover, we have sought to identify new sectors for focused outreach to private companies, association, and academics to help them understand how to protect their intellectual property. I would like to conclude today by asking some questions I would like all of us to consider. For instance, what are the national security implications of Canada's economic recovery post-pandemic? What expectations do citizens have regarding how Canadian authorities should use powerful data-driven technologies for the public good? How do we prevent our data and research from inadvertently advancing hostile foreign military, intelligence, and commercial interests? These are just a few questions that we are slowly coming to ask of ourselves and of Canadians. There is no greater responsibility for a government than the protection of its citizens. In today's dynamic threat environment, government, civil society, and the private sector must work together to harden the targets and protect our national interests. And I ask all of you to work with CSIS in advancing this call to action to protect the security of Canadians and the health of our economy for our future and that of our children. I am an optimist and I know we do, can do it and it, therefore we must. Thank you, Aaron, and everybody online for listening. I'll stop here and be happy to take questions. Super. Uh, thank you very much for that, David. Those are really, um, really insightful uh, set of remarks, but also very, very challenging. Um, and so I'd like to pick up on one theme that you, that you talked about in your remarks and this idea of foreign interference, because I think for many of the people watching and for, indeed for many Canadians, when, especially after 9-11, when, when people thought <coughs> of CSIS, they thought of Al Qaeda, they thought of Bin Laden, they thought of terrorists that were, were somewhere far away uh, and then that posed a threat to Canada. But foreign interference is very different and we're hearing about it more and more, especially since the pandemic, but not as something that's over there it's something that's here right now and it's something that we're, we're wrestling with. So could you talk to us a little bit more about what CSIS is doing to counter foreign interference? Thank you, Aaron. And uh, I'll be remiss uh, if I was not to talk a little bit more about terrorism. But the reality is that uh, today we have uh, Al-Qaeda and Daesh elements in different parts of the world who are actively plotting. Uh, they are reorganizing and they are looking for ways to threaten Canada's and our allies' interests. So this is a reality that has not left us. However, as you mentioned, and as I have illustrated in my, uh, in my remarks, the uh, current environment, uh, globalization, and the uh, rapid changes uh, brought uh, upon us by the pandemic 
have provided an opportunity for increased foreign interference. And so from that perspective, the role of CSIS is really to uh, leverage our, all of the tools we have to counter uh, these activities. Uh, when we see uh, actors uh, engage in uh, elements that are covert and deceptive, where they are threaten, threatening Canadians, when they try to undermine our electoral system, when they try to uh, interfere with the proper course of democracy, different parts uh, of uh, the country, at different levels of government, it is our role as CSIS to play and use all the tools we have at our disposal. We are not doing that on our own. As I said, national security is a team sport. We have, we're working with our colleagues at CSC, at the RCMP, at Global Affairs Canada, for example. We are uh, together as part of the site task force to help uh, protect and secure elections, working with Elections Canada. We are working more and more with, uh, with uh, uh, other actors in Canadian society to provide them with information and advice. And we are actively using uh, our tools to investigate the covert activity that are uh, detrimental to Canada's sovereignty. Uh, thank you for that. And so let me ask you, let me ask you this. Let me ask you a very simple question. You know, given all the change that we're seeing, given the, the, the threat landscape as it's evolving, what keeps you up at night? Is there some sort of a new threat that, that, that's keeping you awake? Is there something that you're really concerned about? Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Uh, I'll keep some of that for uh, my therapist, but uh, what I am comfortable sharing with you is that uh, uh, it's a bit of a cliche in our in our uh, field, but you know, essentially, it's not what we know that is keeping us awake, but it's what we don't know. Uh, in this case, it could be uh, who is behind the IP uh, uh, address that you know is part of a, uh, a forum and that you know is, is threatening uh, violent actions. Who is uh, engaged in uh, encrypted channels, uh, you know, to to plot uh, violence against Canadians? Um, how are uh, Canadian uh, society societal uh, elements are being uh, targeted by foreign actors? Uh, what are the new trade craft uh, tools deployed by our adversaries to undermine Canada's national security? Uh, it, these are the issues when we uh, when we uh, consider, you know, how more complex. The, the role of uh, agencies, intelligence agencies, has become in 21st century. And I talked about data, and this is one of the key areas uh, where we have to continue to make sure we maximize our ability to manipulate extremely large volume of data to be able to, uh, to understand patterns, things that will not be available to the uh, human eyes. Uh, even though we have highly trained analysts that are extremely competent, uh, there is a reason why uh, uh, new technology like artificial intelligence, machine learning, is making allowing us to make you know a very significant leaps in the future. So the challenge we have is how do we continue to modernize that, continue to understand, characterize the threat, find the threat actors before they manifest themselves, and do so in a way that you know preserves Canadian, Canadian values, Canadian rights to privacy, and uh, so it is a, uh, a challenge. But this is you know the. Uh, the challenge that the, the men and women of CSIS uh, and our partners in national security uh, are accomplishing every day. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for that. And maybe, maybe this is a good kind of spot to pick up on this broader theme of, of digital life. And obviously, you know, um, uh, this is a good example of that because we're not in a, in a conference room uh, in Ottawa having this conversation, but we're actually having it virtually. And so the digital life is, is really, really important. It's, it's people's way to connect. It's social media. It's their ability to have conversations with each other. But, you know, in your remarks, you, you touched on um, that this, there's this increasing hateful rhetoric, racist, misog misogynistic, and anti-government rhetoric online so what is what is CSIS's role in that space and, and how does that fit as part of kind of the, the broader response of the government of Canada uh, thanks for that Aaron and obviously it's it's quite topical uh, we have uh, seen the events in, in the south of the border a couple of weeks ago uh, we are seeing um, elements here in Canada uh, who are engaging in, in violent uh, rhetoric online the role, of, the role of CSIS and the role of law enforcement and other law enforcement agencies is to uh, be able to look at what I, uh, I described it, you know, as a funnel. So when you look at the funnel, the role of CSIS and intelligence agency is at the narrow end of it. This is where we have people who are mobilizing for violence. This is where we need to use our tools, uh, all the tools that, that in our at our disposal to investigate, characterize that threat and intervene to reduce that, that threat. Uh, 
what when you look at the funnel, however, most of it is you know is beyond the purview of what of law enforcement and intelligence. It is in the purview, I would say, of, of uh, broader societal actors. Uh, this is not a, a phenomenon, you know, uh, the IMVE that you know should only consider the governments. It should consider all aspects of society. When you look at, you know, uh, I mentioned some statistics of the number of people who have been killed in Canada by some groups, you know, uh, like in cell, uh, people representing uh, as themselves members, or, um, or the individual in, in Quebec City who went to uh, and, and targeted Muslims while they were praying uh, because of, uh, of fear and trying to influence the political course of actions. Uh, people uh, in, in, like the individual Moncton who killed a number of our uh, fellow RCMP colleagues. Um, these are the people who are targeting uh, the fabric of society. Um, we have seen an increase uh, in, in anti-Semitism in Canada as well. And so when you consider all of these factors, the role of intelligence agencies, the role of law enforcement is critical. But it, in my view, it requires a more a broader a societal approach to address these issues. No, that's a, it's a very fair point. And so we've got some questions coming in from the floor. I've got one more question for you, um, and then I'll turn to questions from the audience. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is, is economic recovery, because obviously with the pandemic, now all eyes are turning to economic recovery. How do we, how do we restart the engine and how do we ensure prosperity uh, going forward? And so I, I was wondering if you see CSIS making a contribution to the economic security of Canada and whether or not CSIS has a role in Canada's economic economic recovery. Could you, could you uh, give us some thoughts on that? Thanks, Aaron. Um, actually, as a matter of fact, uh, the evolution of, the, uh, of, of global and national economies in the last number of years have increased the intersection with national security considerations. I've talked about a number of state actors who are uh, looking to leverage all of the tools at their disposal to, for their own advantage. And this is normal. This is what uh, states want to do. In the case, in the Canadian case, what we have to do is to uh, harden ourselves and make it more difficult for corporate deceptive uh, influence. In the context, more specifically in the context of the economy, um, the national security community and CSIS were working very closely with uh, ICED, our uh, economic uh, uh, colleagues, who have uh, under their purview the Investment Canada Act. Uh, we are actively engaged in reviewing a number of transactions, foreign direct investment in Canada, that uh, to determine if there are any national security interests at play here. Uh, this is complex. Uh, the, this is a, war, a world that evolves. Our, our adversaries understand what we do, and they try to look for, for ways to undermine our defenses. Therefore, we need to innovate uh, on an ongoing basis. We also uh, have worked very closely uh, with, uh, uh, and when I talked about us getting out of, out of the shadows, we have worked uh, in a more open way with key companies, uh, with academia, to try to, uh, to share the knowledge we have of the threat of the different ways uh, actors could undermine their, their uh, prosperity and their wherewithal, and you know, hopefully to give them tools uh, and, uh, and provide them with opportunities to defend themselves. So in the future, when we think of a post-pandemic recovery, uh, government, you know, around the world will be will be struggling, and you know, uh, other uh, governments will try, other agencies will try to find, you know, opportunities to take advantage of that. And in the case of, of Canada, CSIS and our partners, we need to be there to protect Canadian interests while we go through the economic recovery. Yeah, no, and I, I really appreciate that because it really exposes this broader notion of uh, collaborative national security, right? The days of spy versus spy are, are gone, and rather we need to think about ways to integrate the whole across across government and the private sector and indeed civil society. So I, I really appreciate that point. Um, I want to go to now to some questions from the floor. So I, we've got a question coming in. Can you comment on the role of the Five Eyes going forward given this landscape? Uh, thank you. Um, actually, uh, it, it's interesting because I've been around national security intelligence issues for, uh, for the better part of uh, 20 years. And um, in the early days, when we were talking about the Five Eyes, it was always hush hush and, and, and secretive and, uh, and not to be discussed in, 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 in other polite company. And now this is something that has been sp being splashed in, in front of newspapers uh, every day. Uh, we have uh, the Five Eyes. The reason why we, we are uh, the Five Eyes is thriving is because we're talking about uh, countries with similar values, 
um, uh, to a large extent, you know, similar uh, approaches to, to liberal democracy uh, and uh, ability to share information, to have the trust, the confidence built over years and years. Our colleagues at CSE have had, you know, relationships going back to right after the Cold War, uh, right after the Second World War, sorry, uh, to, to build on, on this. And I think, you know, this, it, that confidence has, uh, over time has evolved to a point where we now are looking at, you know, broadening the, uh, the partnerships. Uh, the Five Eyes, uh, in my view, will continue to be, uh, remain and be a, a very, uh, the core center of, you know, our Canada's national securities approach, which we're working very closely with other partners outside the Five Eyes uh, that, you know, are extremely important for Canada's national security. I also think that, you know, uh, when we look at the, um, at the development of, uh, of uh, in the geopolitical issues these days, um, liberal democracies, uh, uh, market economy, as opposed to state capitalist economy, uh, people who are looking at, at uh, hardening their se themselves, creating partnerships, you know, to protect their interests, uh, uh, while we see the rise of other partners or their, uh, other countries, I should say, that, you know, uh, may have different perspective. I think, you know, we will continue to see uh, the, these alliances uh, from a national security perspective. And if we were to talk about the military, I would obviously talk about NATO here as a cornerstone of, uh, of our uh, uh, um, security uh, with, with NORAD and the, our American colleagues. So when you look at the architecture of how Canada's uh, uh, security, both here in Canada and around the world, we will continue to see the Five Eyes, our traditional alliances, but also uh, not, it's not a, a scoop. I think you know it's clear that we'll need to broaden that and get more, much more closer, uh, more, work more closely with our uh, other uh, part, key partners. No, and that, that makes perfect sense, right? I appreciate that the Five Eyes is, is a bedrock alliance for us, but the world is indeed changing, and so thinking through new partnerships and new strategies only makes complete sense. Um, so we've got another question here coming in, and it, this actually cuts a bit of a different way, but I think it's a good one. So the question is, what are the biggest misconceptions Canadians have about the work of CSIS? <laughs> Uh, that that's an interesting one, and it could take uh, some time. Uh, I would say that uh, so it's my second time working at CSIS. I have worked in the national security environment. I have seen you know CSIS uh, from the inside and the outside. And what I would say is that it, it's uh, an organization with uh, extremely talented men and women from all uh, different venues of Canada. Uh, it is an organization that you know has been working with accountability and review for a long, long time. And so, uh, unfortunately, the way uh, the way things work is often when you hear about CSIS is become because there's been a problem, uh, there's been a hiccup, or there's been something more significant that a review organizations that has access to all of our information, the most classified information, they have access to it, or with the when the court says, you know what, you know, you should have been more candid with us, you should have tell, told us more information when you sought, you know, these authorities. So that's when Canadians, you know, hear about, about CSIS. They are never hearing about the good things that are ha happening. Um, there are a number of things that are happening as we speak that, you know, are uh, sometimes are even in media that, you know, the footprint of CSIS is nowhere to be seen. And that's okay, that's, that's uh, how it should be because uh, even though we are uh, working with secret, we're not a secret organization, but you know we are. We still need to have uh, the ability, and, and we should be remaining in the shadow. But it's really that perception of, of uh, that often that you know is left uh, in the in people's mind uh, because of really bad incidents that may have happened in the past. So what I would like to to offer to people is inform yourself about CSIS, ask questions of us, demand answers from us, ask for more transparency from us, and you know I, I think you will be reassured that contrary to our adversaries, CSIS is an organization that works uh, in a democratic environment in a country governed by the rule of law. We respect privacy and we strive to make, you know, to protect Canadians to the best of our ability. It doesn't mean that we will not have, have problems and that sometimes we will not, you know, make a wrong decision, but we're accountable for these decisions. And, you know, we have processes internally and externally to make sure we catch these problems and we address them in a timely way. So I would like to try to reassure Canadians, but don't just take my word, uh, inform yourself about, about the work we do. And I would uh, also ask specifically to marginalized communities. We have done a number of outreach efforts in the past to try to, to uh, engage 
uh, with communities. And I would, would very much want to continue that and welcome uh, that kind of engagement. But an informed society uh, is a society that can make you know, uh, better choices, in my view. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And I, I do appreciate that it's a challenge when you work for an organization and your successes need to stay need to say stay secret um, but every time something goes wrong it's it's front page news but I, I think that was a really nuanced answer so thank you for that we've got another question coming in uh, director Vigneault CSIS and other agencies involved in safeguarding the 2019 election from foreign interference had months to prepare does the context of a m minority parliament change this where the writ could drop uh, any time on a confidence vote I think it, um, uh, what we have developed uh, with our uh, partners at uh, CSC, RCMP, and Global Affairs Canada, the, uh, the uh, Secret Intelligence Task Force on Elections, or SITE, I think is a model that you know, uh, is, uh, has uh, proven itself. Uh, we have kept it going. Our, our uh, people are meeting uh, as, uh, probably as we speak, or this week they're talking about you know, uh, readiness, preparedness. We have increased our, uh, our um, uh, connective tissue, if I can put it this way, with Elections Canada and other partners, uh, the Commissioner of Canada's election, to make sure that, you know, as I have used the expression I've used before, we are hardening our electoral and, and democratic processes in Canada. So we are uh, lucky because we have a very robust electoral process uh, in Canada. Uh, but we should not rest on our laurels. We should be in a position to continue to, to understand how interference in elections can take place. One of the interesting and, and, and uh, problematic phenomenon is also the issue of disinformation. How legitimate and illegitimate actors are using social media, uh, often obfuscating uh, who they are, uh, to try to sow dissension in our democratic processes, in our societies. And I think you know this goes to the point where you know we need to look at national security, the hard core of national security as extremely important. But you also need to understand how it works outside uh, the outside circles, how they need to be integrated. And so, from um, to go back to the specific, I would say that uh, uh, the key agencies, uh, uh, including CSIS, uh, we are ready for uh, when uh, the writ will be dropped. Thank you. Yeah, because it, you know obviously. In a democratic society, elections are the bedrock, right? It's the bedrock of rule of law. It's the bedrock of our entire system. And when a foreign adversary tries to undermine that bedrock, it strikes at the kind of the core of the Canadian Canadian society and, the, and Canadian identity. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, we've now got a question coming in on university research. Can you elaborate on specific threats to the university research and healthcare efforts related to the pandemic? Is it stealing information? Is it disinformation or undermining? Canada's pandemic response? Uh, I don't want to be tried, but I would say all of the above. Um, I think, you know, when we look at universities, uh, we, Canada, are blessed with uh, extremely talented researchers, uh, great national institutions across uh, the board in, uh, with our universities. Um, they are open uh, and they are attractive to uh, talent from around the world. That's why they're so good. But it's also, unfortunately, how some, uh, some hostile act actors are trying to take advantage of, of the universities. Uh, during the pandemic, specifically, what we have seen is a, intense competition for, in the early days for trying to understand you know, uh, the, the vectors of potential uh, vaccine. Uh, we've tried to understand some of the, uh, the, the biopharmaceutical you know, cap capacity of different countries. We have seen you know, actors, and it's been made public in this case, that. Uh, at, uh, Russian uh, intelligence services uh, actively targeted some Canadian companies to uh, to try to uh, steal information in the early days of development of vaccine. And so our openness uh, is what makes us great, but it's also sometimes what makes us uh, you know, vulnerable. And so uh, this is not a question here of, of, of uh, closing the doors uh, because uh, this is not how we're going to be able to innovate and, and create future prosperity for the country but it's to do it in a way that understands the threats that exist, uh, not to be paranoid about them, but to educate uh, uh, ourselves uh, as a system, as a community, and find the better ways to protect uh, the, core, uh, the crown jewels that are being developed in laboratories and universities across the country now, what will be the bedrock uh, to, of our prosperity in the future. 
And so I, this is why I, I believe, you know, the work at, that you do at CG today is so important. You know, you talked in your opening remarks, uh, Aaron, about breaking down silos. That is exactly why we need to break the, them down. We have extremely talented people at CSIS, at CSC, at the RCMP, in other national security organizations in our military that have knowledge that, you know, they can help, like, help to protect you know other organizations in the country and this is this ecosystem that we need to create and hopefully you know through events like yours and an initiative like yours we'll be able to uh, make a dent into that yeah, thank you for that and it was um, it was a very good answer and it was nuanced my approach was a little bit different i'd ri written previously that there's a special place in hell uh, for somebody who will attack a laboratory or a testing facility during the pandemic um, because lives can be lost and it's just absolutely inexcusable that anybody a state or a criminal enterprise would would, would undertake that activity but it's uh, it's I, I appreciate that you that you all are wrestling with it um, we've got another question coming in with a focus as was indicated on hardening targets and strengthening defense what are some of the unique ways that CSIS is striving to innovate and strengthen its proactive efforts to match its reactive ones? So really, could you talk to us about the proactive efforts that you're undertaking to kind of to help harden targets and strengthen defense across the country? So I'll go and use two, uh, two types of responses. The first one is a very open and uh, overt one, which is uh, our uh, outreach. Uh, over the years, uh, CSIS has developed a very uh, robust uh, outreach program that seeks the best uh, information, the most talented people in Canada and around the world to better understand uh, and, and better educate ourselves and therefore uh, determine where we need to go in the future uh, in terms of, of addressing threats. So uh, we have done that. I mentioned you know, our outreach during the pandemic uh, we have reached uh, outreach to more than 2,000 people, uh, hundreds of Canadian companies, laboratories, uh, institutes uh, in biopharma sector mostly, to uh, be able to to provide with them with information and and uh, and uh, and advice. We have done so in concert with a number of, of organizations, including the Center for Cybersecurity, and you know this is essentially to to get, you know, I use the analogy often is to. Uh, to reduce the size of the fishing net. So we need to make it harder and harder for someone to, to pass through our defenses. And the defenses in this case, there will be the uh, cybersecurity, internal security uh, policies of different organizations. There will be you know, their own internal uh, procedures. Um, in a democracy, you would not want to have a uh, uh, CSIS you know, uh, behind every door, uh, nor would we have the resources. That's why it is really an opportunity here for different companies to, to engage, you know, and, and, and get uh, uh, to harden themselves. The other way we are proactive is we, by using our threat reduction measures. Um, we are uh, on an ongoing basis using the authorities of the CSIS Act to undertake uh, threat reduction measures against different actors uh, to uh, make sure that, you know, again, uh, we raise the cost uh, of them trying to do something nefarious against gaining an interest. Thank you. And actually, the next question coming in dovetails perfectly with that, this broader notion of cybersecurity. So this question says, in the case of a cyber attack on a small business server, does CSIS wish to know about the attack, whether it's geo or not? And if so, what is the way to let CSIS be aware of that attack? So uh, the uh, easy answer is yes, uh, we do want to know. Um, uh, cybersecurity is a very complex and evolving uh, domain. Uh, we are uh, blessed in Canada. We have very talented organizations. Our colleagues at the CSE are really talented. They have national and international networks to work with them. At CSIS, we have uh, uh, very talented people again, working with our domestic and international partners. But what is really important is how this, uh, I'll use this analogy again, this ecosystem. Um, we have uh, different authorities, different accesses, different strengths between uh, different organizations and the government. So what is important in the case of, of uh, the specific uh, question is for the information to reach a government. Uh, we have uh, more and more robust the confliction processes amongst you know different agencies to make sure uh, who is the best place to to address the issue, um, and you know uh, uh, we have different mandates 
and we have different authorities. And this is why I would say that, you know, what is important is for an organization that has been victimized or believes has been victimized by a cyber actor is to reach out uh, to a CSIS, to CSE, uh, or to, to the RCMP. But make sure you're not uh, keeping that uh, on your own. Uh, the downsides in the future for the organi for your organization and ultimately for the country is too significant. Thank you for that. And this, this actually, the next question um, goes right to the core of one of the tensions in, in national security and that's this, this dichotomy between privacy and security or individual rights and security. So the question reads, it's a thin line between preserving our security and driving up uh, or, and giving up our privacy to do so. How will you balance these two? Well, I, actually, you know, it's uh, the equation here is is not just a balance, in my view. I think you know you need to have both. You know, you need to to maximize privacy in a way that you're also finding a way to maximize the ability of of the uh, organizations in Canada who have uh, uh, a mandate by Parliament by Canadians to protect them. And here you take you, you we, uh, we know more and more about our private companies now uh, who are using data that are harvesting through all of the different transactions, the footprint that we all leave behind when we do something. So when you think that you know a, a grocery store will have information and, and data that you know we're leaving behind that takes a, a, a warrant from the federal court for CSIS to go and obtain, uh, we, we should continue to, to look for the opportunities to maximize both the privacy of Canadians and of, of the agencies, in this case, CSIS. And, and I just want to be very clear. I don't want people to, to think that, you know, we're trying to, uh, to move away from judicial authorization or, or, or different ways. What I'm saying is that the act that was built in 1984 and now in 2021, the world has changed significantly. The expectations of Canadians uh, has changed both in terms of privacy and in terms of what they are expecting uh, uh, the, their government to do to protect them in a more th threatening environment that I've described in the first part of this uh, discussion today. And so this is why I think having an open dialogue is critical in Canada. And uh, I, would, I would say that in the last number of, of, of years and probably decades, this, uh, this dialogue has never really taken place. It is always and too often been described as a zero-sum game. It's either you know uh, authorities for agencies to spy on people or, or full privacy. Um, this is, uh, as we say in French, réducteur. This is a too simplistic a view. I think Canada deserves a more uh, dynamic and a more uh, mature uh, discussion on these issues. And this is what I hope that we can, can achieve in Canada. I couldn't agree more, actually. And um, this is not a paid advertisement, but uh, Craig Forsyth and uh, Leah West's new uh, book on national security law has a really good exposition on this this tension uh, in there. So if anybody in the audience is looking for something a little bit uh, a little bit um, uh, deeper to read on that, you can I would commend that text to you as well. Um, so we actually now have a question coming in uh, about CSIS's role abroad. So what is CSIS's role abroad? I know you have foreign stations. What do they do? Well, uh, I will not uh, tell you exactly what they do, uh, but um, I will just first go back to the, the, uh, the act. And so uh, CSIS is mandated to collect security intelligence, so intelligence about terrorism, espionage, uh, interference, and we have no uh, geographical limitations on that. We can do it anywhere in Canada, anywhere in the world. Um, where we have limitations is the ability to collect foreign intelligence. We can only collect foreign intelligence in Canada. And this is a subject, uh, some of you follow uh, judicial issues, a uh, subject of, uh, of litigation as we speak. But in, in the context of our operations abroad, uh, we are engaged uh, with partners uh, locally, um, and we are uh, pursuing uh, threats, uh, threat actors who are engaged in terrorism, uh, espionage uh, against Canadian interest. Uh, we are using all the tools at our disposal. We are leveraging partnerships, some of, it, of whom I've talked about before and others who are uh, non-traditional partnerships. And we always do that with, with the goal of you know, finding the information that will make a difference in protecting Canadians, uh, citizens, uh, their lives and their interests. And this is a very complex environment. Uh, are the men and women of CSIS, when they go abroad, often they'll take risks. Uh, it is a challenging environment. 
um, it is getting more and more difficult to do that type of work given uh, the uh, ubiquitousness of, uh, of some uh, surveillance technologies, um, the, uh, the uh, danger of some of the operating environments that we're in in terms of violence, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, disease and so on. But uh, we are not uh, short of, uh, of volunteers to go uh, on these missions. Thank you. And we only have a few minutes left uh, together. I know you have a, a hard stop at 2.30. So I got one last question for you and then we can, we can wrap up. Are Canadians more vulnerable to targeting by hostile actors as a result of telework? Um, I will say unfortunately, yes. Um, we have done some, uh, some uh, work on that with, uh, within CSIS and with partners. And, um, and what is happening is uh, to use uh, inside baseball lingo, we, uh, the, uh, the threat surface has expanded. So before you had a number of internet nodes that were controlled by the government. Uh, in, in the case of Canada, we have very robust uh, presence by Shared Services Canada and CSE to control very few internet, uh, the nodes to the, to, that access to the internet. When you're going home, you are increasing uh, that threat surface uh, very significantly. Um, we have uh, our, our colleagues uh, our, uh, in, in government are doing a really, really good job of, of securing that. But when uh, the government, you know, is investing uh, resources, time and, and, uh, and the uh, innovation of very uh, top quality people to do that, when you're thinking of, uh, of a small, medium enterprise, uh, when you're thinking about uh, organizations at uh, NGOs who may have, you know, very important uh, data and information, that are of interest uh, to another country, it's one thing to try to secure a server, but when you have a number of people who are distributed, you know, across a non-secure network, or are just, you know, accessing the internet from home with very little uh, security, it becomes, you know, more problematic. So I would, uh, for sure, you know, uh, the pandemic hopefully will uh, will uh, get into a different tra trajectory in the next number of, of uh, months. But you know the tendency or the, the trends of uh, of having people working from home will will likely uh, continue at a very significant pace, and so each organization will have to find ways to protect the information, the key information that is uh, core to their their their, uh, their ability to function. A lot of private information also circulate there, and so uh, unfortunately, a number of of people, a number of them will be uh, will be state actors, but also unfortunately, a number of them are also criminal actors. And this is where, you know, the, the risk of increase of ransomware, which unfortunately we have seen in the, during the pandemic, uh, these, these are types of activities will continue in the future. And so I talked about citizenry uh, becoming more literate. I think, you know, being more literate in terms of cybersecurity is going to be a requirement in the, in the future years. Thank you for that, David, and, and thank you very much for, for a really fascinating conversation with us today. Um, I really appreciate your view that national security, economic prosperity, intellectual property, sovereignty, and national interests are all linked. And it's not just because it mirrors my own view, but I actually think that's going to be the key to unlocking this nuanced and sophisticated conversation about national security uh, that you called for um, in, your, in your remarks. Um, so if you'd like to watch this event again uh, or share it with colleagues, it will be uh, posted on CG's YouTube channel shortly. And also please join us on March 30th at 1.30 p.m. for a discussion with Vincent Rigby, National Security and Intelligence Advisor to the Prime Minister, on his role in supporting the government in responding to national security challenges in the 21st century. Uh, to register for that, please uh, go to CG Online forward slash events or subscribe uh, to CG Online. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, all the uh, all the social channels, so you can find us there as well, and you can learn more about our publications there. And finally, I know that many of you watching today are from the Canadian security and intelligence and defense communities, and I wanted to thank you, uh, and I wanted to let you all know how much we appreciate your efforts. Uh, the pandemic has certainly complicated your jobs, and you actually have one of the only jobs in the world where you have to be right 100% of the time, and the bad guys only have to be right once. And indeed, what we were talking about earlier is that we can't celebrate your successes. They have to stay secret. Um, so I wanted to genuinely thank you for everything that you do uh, to ensure our national security, our economic prosperity, and Canada's future. Thank you very much for joining us. Stay safe and have a great day.